Aeneid Book 4 examines the sad demise of a great female leader. Normally, we have a lot of fun on these live streams, but we want to warn you today that there's some challenging themes uh, and content, most notably suicide. So we'll review the book while at the same time practicing sight reading and reading comprehension. And today we have a, a special guest requested by a viewer. So uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. William Lee of AP Daily. Uh, Salway, William. Salway, Tay, Ben, and Jenny. Thank you for having me here. I'm so glad to be here today to be with two of my favorite peeps in the world. Who's that, William? That would be you guys. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. We were wondering who um, was watching along. <laughs> yeah. I am. Uh, I'm. I'm a little overwhelmed now that I'm outnumbered as the the sole mainer with two Texans here. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. Please don't. Please don't warm nace all all of the. Uh, <laughs> we have to warm nace all the time. All the okay. time. Uh, William, we are so excited to have you here with us, and I'm especially excited because Ben often quizzes me during these live streams, but um, I'm excited that he's going to be asking you about the passages and Whoa. not just me today. <laughs> what? You don't didn't get tell me about that. Wrong, <laughs> Whew, okay, <laughs> pressure now. <laughs> we know. We know that you will do a great job. So. Let's go ahead and get into Aeneid Book 4. Okay, so today uh, we are going to, uh, as we talked about, uh, look at Book 4. There are three uh, big sections of Aeneid Book 4, um, and we're going to review the tragedy of Dido. And as I said, we're going to look at reading comprehension and sight reading. And uh, stay tuned here for the end, where we have an uh, amazing Kahoot. Um, so you'll want to stay up to date and current uh, with us as we get to that. Uh, just to remind you all, um, we have a, <laughs> we have uh, a, I, I'm sorry, it says link goes here. So <laughs> <laughs> look below. <laughs> so there's a link. Uh, you'll want to look at the bottom of this in order to find the, the link. Um, the rainbow says that there will be a, uh, things will be much brighter um, at the end. Um, yes, although I the think pot the, of gold. Yeah, the pot of gold. So um, please check in the comments about um, to find the link for, to give us some uh, feedback on how we're doing and how we are updating or not updating our slides when we get the link. Well, um, and um, <laughs> Ben, I don't know if you want to mention it. People obviously are able to find the link um, because we had a good question um, about the pandemic and um, how we think it's going to impact AP scores this year. So I don't know if you want to address it now. Is this a good time? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Well, I just want to reassure all the students and teachers out there that um, when um, the um, statisticians and those kinds of people are looking at the scores, they're only comparing the scores within a certain year. So I know that um, most of us have missed lots of instructional time this year, and you may be worried that you might get compared to, um, you know, students from three years ago when it was a more normal school year, um, but you won't be. Um, they're just going to look at the scores of the students from this year. And of course, um, you know, we, I, I, I don't know many schools that haven't been really impacted by the pandemic. So, so what you're saying is like on a translation, if um, normally getting 13 of those um, syntactical units, what do you call them? Um, segments, maybe. Chunks, segments, segments. <laughs> uh, when you get th normally like 13 would be like what you would want for like a five or 12 or something like that. They're not going to look at what they normally expect. They're, I, they're going to just see how, how the questions perform and then make the call up from that. Right? Exactly. In this okay. particular year. Okay. Hopefully that'll make some people feel better. Every year though, every year too, because they need to figure out like some passages are harder than others. And mm -hmm. you know, that you want to look at how the passages perform um, in order to uh, see whether they are hard because you know, sometimes the data uh, throws you a curveball and gives you different information than what you expect. Absolutely. So, so okay, so book four, um, the three different sections that we cover here uh, focus on Aeneas and Dido, a uh, wedding in a cave, or did they? Um, that, I guess, comes down to different perspectives there. Uh, rumor flies, a fantastic image, uh, flies through Africa, and Iarbus, um, one of Dido's suitors and a uh, uh, king of the people around Carthage, um, is frustrated and begs Jupiter for help, his, his dad. And so at Jupiter's orders, Mercury uh, flies down and tells Aeneas that it's time for him to leave Carthage. He has to think about the greater mission to go on to Italy. And so Aeneas decides to leave, but maybe it's not, not the best time to tell Dido. Like, I'll, we'll just figure out a better time. And 
don't worry, Aeneas will tell her when it's appropriate. But for right now, Trojans, just shh, be quiet and <laughs> secretly go. Don't tell anyone, because now is not the best time for Dido to find out. Um, but of course, Dido senses everything. Um, and uh, as Virgil says, you know, who can deceive a lover? Um, and uh, she learns about it first, and then they have this, this fight, um, this verbal sparring. Um, that takes up a large part, actually, of our syllabus. And as Aeneas sails away, then at the end of book four, Dido kills herself uh, on a pyre after recounting her the things that she's done. And um, her sister comes in and sees everything. And uh, Iris um, is sent down by Juno in order to, um, to end Dido's life. And that is where the rainbow comes in. And it's a bit of a uh, very... Uh, very pretty uh, tension relieving moment at the very end of a very stressful book. Yeah, um, it's uh, one of my students' uh, favorite parts of book four is to read uh, when Iris comes in to kind of relieve Dido of her suffering. And we're all um, very relieved because it's an incredibly sad part of the Aeneid. All right, well, uh, I guess speaking of stressful, let's talk a little bit about sight reading. Um, so I want, we've been talking about the sections of the exam, how um, half of your score is based on the multiple choice section and half of your score is based on the free response section. I want to reassure everybody that um, sight reading only appears on the multiple choice section. That always seems to make my students feel better that they're not going to have to write an essay, for instance, about um, a passage of sight reading. Or translation um, on something that is not on the syllabus. Right, exactly. Now, um, we, we were talking about how you may have lost some instructional time this year. And so um, I do want to also remind you at this point um, that if you're anxious because maybe your teacher wasn't able to get to everything, there is in AP Classroom an AP Daily video for every single part of the syllabus. So you may just have to take the initiative in these last two weeks to go there and make sure you've looked at all of the lines. Um, so the sight reading takes up about half of your multiple choice time. There are two passages. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about some tips for what to do when you encounter those passages. They will be um, the last two that you should encounter in the multiple choice. The first two will be the ones that you should have seen before. So um, first thing to do is just to kind of orient yourself with the passage. Um, there will be a title in English, um, and there will also be glosses or definitions at the bottom of the um, passage. So make sure you read through those to give yourself some context. There's lots of research that even in your native language, reading without context is really challenging. Um, and then you'll want to look over the passage um, to try to get a quick idea more of the content and structure that you're going to be dealing with. Is it poetry? Is it prose, for instance? Um, you'll want to use the punctuation and also the lines, the line divisions in poetry to kind of divide up the passage for yourself into units of meaning. And in each of those clauses or units of meaning, um, you'll want to focus on that um, kind of the, the bones of it that we've talked about before. Um, what is the nominative subject or what is the verb and what does that tell you about the subject? You'll want to use those syntactical units that we talked about in translating, um, like prepositional phrases, um, to, you know, really help you try to gain understanding of not only the structure of the passage, but meaning, of course. Um, and then as you read each word, think about not only what it means, but also what the ending tells you about how it's used in the sentence and then what you expect based on that. We'll, we'll look at some of those things today, hopefully. Um, and then keep in mind that um, these same tips are going to be useful as you encounter um, the essay on the free response, the scene passages on the multiple choice, um, the short answer questions. You can still use these strategies from the site reading. Uh, in fact, these, this actually works great for everything that you do with Latin. I mean, minus the fact you might not have a title, um, but uh, but yeah, this is this is great reading advice in general, Jenny. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. No. Well, hopefully, this will give um, students a little more confidence as they encounter the passages on the exam itself. Okay. So uh, let's uh, look at examples then. Spectamus exempla. We have uh, Mr. William Lee here with us that we're going to quiz. And so, uh, William, uh, we have this passage here, um, and uh, this passage we've selected, it's, oh, it's from book four, but it's not from a section that 
that has been covered on the AP syllabus. Okay. Today. So uh, we titled this Dido asks Anna for advice. Uh, there's a nice little picture there of Dido and Anna conversing. Um, and ben, so is this I do... going to be like her Tommen where I can buzz? <laughs> you, you, yes, you need to buzz in, um, but there's no competition. So Says the former National Kurtaman Chair. <laughs> um, ben, I do want to point out, we had a great question on our feedback form about whether all of the passages on the exam are going to have a citation. and um, Citation like of, line numbers, right? Yeah, and all of them will except for the site readings. So we've given it to you here because we want to situate you in book four of the Aeneid. Um, but that also often reassures my students that on the free response section, it's going to tell them whether it's from the Aeneid or De Bello Gallico, and it's going to tell them what book it's from and that kind of thing. So, you know, hopefully that'll make students feel better too. Yeah, and that's something where like you, if you know generally what happens in the books and in the different parts of each book, um, you can definitely gain some um, some context. You know, there are some similar passages, in fact, like between book four and book six, when Aeneas is speaking to Dido in both of them. Um, and it can be very easy to confuse the two, um, but it's also really important to know if you're working in book four or if you're working in the underworld in book six. So, uh, so that's that's a great context and and good advice. Good advice. Okay, so we're so uh, we're here, and I think I think what's the context of this passage, Jenny? If we're at the beginning of book four. Yeah. So the beginning of book four, if uh, I remember correctly, um, Dido's fall with Aeneas at that banquet. Um, where he told his story of the Trojan War and his travels. And so um, I'm guessing that she's asking for, Anna, uh, for Anna's thoughts about that relationship. So let's see if I'm right. Uh, yeah, and I see some, um, some names here that put me into good context, like Sakai or Penates or Erebo, which I know from, um, from my readings of book six refers to uh, the underworld and stuff like that. So, okay. So let's go on. Uh, William, are you ready? I think so. Like, okay, okay. Thank you for giving me some time to kind of like quickly read through this thing. <laughs> Talk That's about what we're here for. Sight. Breathe, uh, breathe deeply. Okay. So uh, these are going to be multiple choice. So uh, to help you out. Uh, and the first one here is the translation of Fatebor in line one. Uh, is it, I confess, I was confessing, I will confess, or I had confessed. What do you think? Uh, um, well, let's see. So fate or with the bore ending, I think that is a deponent verb and future. So I'm going to go with C, but I'm not just going to say C, I will confess. I'm going to do something that um, I have my kids do. So I'm going to be the kids today and they know I'm talking about my students. So for A, I'm going to do this. For B, I'm going to pull on my earlobes, pretend. For C, I'm going to bang on my desk like this. And for D, I'm going to go on the roller coaster ride. Woo! So okay. I think for this one, it's going to be C. Okay, okay. banging on your desk. Uh, yes. That is correct. Uh, yes. You're right. It's future. It's deponent. Um, actually, the that it's deponent isn't actually doesn't factor into the translations because they're all active in meaning. Um, but yeah, that that bow in uh, in Fatebor it helps us know that it's this this is future. So I will confess, Anna. Okay. Uh, the next question here uh, is uh, what was Aeneas, who's the heek in line three? That's good context. Uh, what was he the only person to do? Is it A, change Dido's feelings, B, work at Carthage, C, kill her brother, or B, D, bring the Penates to Carthage? Well, if you look at that line, it says in, in flex it sensus. So I think that means to change Dido's feelings. So I'm going to go with that. Okay. You're, yes, on your nose. Uh, so you weren't distracted by the word Penates in the second line? Uh, no, because I really focused on line three with the hick. I think that really helped me kind of narrow that answer down. Yeah, and in fact, the, I think these penates in line two are referring to um, uh, the penates uh, for Dido back in Tyre, um, her her own household gods, uh, besprinkled with um, Fraterna Kaide, um, her the her brother's um, uh, death. Okay, sorry going off on this passage a little bit. Uh, what about this next one, William? Uh, in line four, what does Dido recognize? Uh, I've highlighted some words over there to help you out. 
Okay, so Agnosco, I recognize the Westigia, the remnants, like the vestigial organs, like your coxa. So remnants of old flame. Hmm. So old flame is usually passion. So I'm going to say B. Uh, love? B, uh, you'll put talking on your ears. Is that right? Yes. Okay, it kind of looks like you're crying a little bit. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'll do this. Uh, yes, that's right. So, uh, Westigia, yeah, the the uh, the footprints um, of the old flame, which which refers to love. Yeah, lots of fire burning uh, love uh, imagery in book four. Uh, okay, so uh, in line six, we have this pater. Pater is always a great question to ask because there's lots of lots of fathers um, in the Aeneid, especially. So, who is this pater? Is it Anchises? Is it Aeneas? Is it Jupiter? Is it Psycheus? Well, let's see. Well, pater omnipotens. All right. So usually in the Aeneid, when I see pater omnipotens, the all-powerful father, that's kind of like the giveaway for Jupiter. So Jupiter, Jupiter. Uh, banging on your drums. Yes, it's Jupiter. Uh, and I, I loved how you went to the passage and you looked at the context, right? Um, because you don't want to just assume. You want to make sure that your um, the, the, the choices that you make for your answers are grounded in the passage um, and uh, in that context. And the context often will help you out quite a bit. So nice job with that. Uh, in lines six through eight, we learned that Dido would prefer to die uh, than spend another night without Aeneas, violate the will of the fates, open up Carthage's borders, or abandon her modesty. What do you think? Ooh, okay. So let's see. Um, so... Uh, so she says something about like, I'd rather, um, die and, and, or break her, the oath, pudor, which is modesty. So, and then something about, let's see, may the omnipotent father either drive me to the shades with the lightning bolt or, um, the, the deep night and the pale shadows, for Erebus. So I think I'm going to go with Woo! <laughs> D, abandon, abandon her, her modesty. modesty. Okay. Um, yeah, that's right. And okay. you like, they got this, okay. this wheel low, right? And the <laughs> race solo. Uh, yeah. She's actually uh, speaking to her, her modesty here, um, which is uh, an interesting, uh, what's that figure of speech called? I believe it's apostrophe. Is that right? I think that's correct. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Yeah, yeah because it, her, it her can't modesty can't respond. Yeah, yeah exactly. Very good. Exactly. Very good. It's nice bringing in a couple of uh, different skills here. Okay, <laughs> in lines 9 through 10, the ille, which uh, is repeated, refers to whom? Is it Anchises, Aeneas, Jupiter, Psycheus? Another great question, you know, who the reference of these pronouns. All right, so let's look at lines 9 through 10, ille. Meus primos qui me sibi yunxet amores obstulit. So that one stole my loves. The first who joined me to him. Hmm. Okay, the first. Okay. And then may he have these things with him and may he protect it um, in his tomb. Okay, so the sepulchro is the one that's given me an idea. So I think it's going to be Woo! Uh, Psycheus, Psycheus. Right? Psycheus. Mm -hmm. She's not in love with Anchises. No, right? no. Yeah, uh, and I think it's interesting because um, Hick earlier is Aeneas, and now it's juxtaposed with Ille, the other lover. This guy, guy, that guy. Just, this this guy, that guy. Right. So, yeah, yeah, I like how Virgil uses his pronouns there. That that's really cool that we can see like the different people there being referred to uh, in different ways. Absolutely. Kind of keep a keep a mental list of it. Okay, uh, in line eleven we have this efata. So how would you translate it? The fates having spoken, going to speak, having been said. All right. So seek efata um, in this way. So if you know the seek, let's pl plug in the answers again. Use your kind of test taking strategy. So that's the fates. That's having spoken. That's going to speak. Having been said. I think A is out. Um, I think, again, this is from the opponent verb. And so I'm going to say 
B having spoken. <laughs> Tugging on your ears. Uh, yeah, this is these are Virgil's closing quotation marks. Um, yeah, having spoken thus, yeah, she um, she uh, began to cry. Right, the tears sprung up. She filled up her um, her senum, her her middle section area. <laughs> she cried on her dress. Okay, That's there what we she go. Was saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. She filled her dress with tears. Her bay, the the bay, is now filled with an ocean of tears. Exactly. Oh. Okay, we have Luke <laughs> in line 12. How would you translate that? Than light, with light, in light, because of light. Uh, looks like this is an ablative question. Yeah, and, you know, this is where I think students really need to kind of look at the whole context because an ablative, it could be by, with, from, in, because, <laughs> than. All these things could be possibilities. So let's look at that line. Oh, Luke. Magus delecta sorori. So, okay. Love more. Okay, because magus is more. So I'm going to go with Luke, then light to sister. Is that right? Okay. Uh, oh, your finger is on your uh, nose. Yeah. That is A, right? That's A? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. This is the okay. end light. Uh, and you were right. You saw the magus, right? That uh, That comparative. Um, adverb there. And that's going to be the thing that's going to anticipate an ablative of comparison. Um, so we translate Luke as than light. She's loved more than light to her sister and by her sister. Okay. Uh, in line 13, my reigns is translated grieving, slaughtering, dripping, dividing. All right. So I can't just rely on the NS here because, yeah. you know, it's, it's a, it, they're all in, they're all translation. It's a vocab from, question. It's a vocab question. So uh, my reo, I believe, means grieving. And so I'm going to go with. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's right. So she is grieving. Yes. Yeah. Um, and let's see, according to line 14. Uh, what is the one thing that Anna is concerned that it will never know the joy of? Is it desserts, spoils of war, children, or eternal life? What do you think and why? Well, let's look at that line. Nec doces natos veneris nec primia noris. So um, you'll never know neither the doces natos, so like the sweet children, of love in this case, nor the rewards of love. So I would say <laughs> children. Children. Uh, and that's correct. Yeah. Woo! We're hoping you go with desserts for the dulces, the sweets, but it's the sweet children, right? Okay. And uh, I think that's it. This is the last one. There we go. Okay. So we're going to switch off. We're going to go to Jenny now just to give William a little bit of a break. Put um, me in the hot seat. I'm ready. Yeah. I mean, it's your turn. You deserve it. Um, so we've talked before about how it's important to uh, look at the, the bare bones of the sentence and of the passage. And often that's looking at uh, verbs and their subjects, especially when you're lost here. And so this is a section uh, from 4, 160 to 168. We don't have a title here, but the title may be something like, there is a storm. Uh, yeah, and, and and this is from the syllabus, right? This is from the syllabus. This is not yeah. sight reading. Yeah, you might remember that interia magno miscere murmure kylum, that famous alliteration there. Yeah. Um, and uh, so uh, we have a bunch of verbs here. Jenny, I would love to have you find the nominative subjects for for each of these verbs. Okay, I will, I will be glad to do this. And I think this is, you know, we've talked about how this is a great strategy, even for scene passages, if you're just trying to figure out kind of where you are and what's going on. Um, so um, all those students that, you know, who are watching asynchronously may pause now. I think uh, we'll just keep moving on so that okay. we can get to that Kahoot in time, right? Oh, and, so, and uh, there's this underlined conscious iter. Uh, I want you to talk about that one specifically, because that that's a nominative, but you know, there's something funky going on with that. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. I will pay attention to that. Thank you for the warning. Yeah. So, um, in Teria, meanwhile, um, the um, nominative for incipit is kylum. The sky begins, um, I believe, um, to be mixed with a great 
murmur with a great rumbling. Um, and then we have something following within sequitur. So I see that nimbus, um, which looks nominative. So the, um, the rain cloud follows um, in sequitur with hail mixed in. Yeah, that's an ablative absolute. Sometimes right. people think about that mixed with hail, but it's an ablative absolute there. Yeah, yeah they're both ablative. OK, so now we're looking at petiere. Um, we've got a little bit of a gap. And I see all sorts of polysyntheton, I believe, here. The et turi e comites is nominative. The et troiana uentis is nominative. Dardanios que nepos nominative. So um, I think it's those those three, the um, Tyrian comrades and the Trojan youth and the Dardanian grandson of Venus. Yeah, very good. What is this? Who what sought. is this petiere? It looks like an infinitive to me. Me. Yeah, it does. But you can tell from the eye that it's actually coming from the third principal part, um, petiwi. I know it's syncopated and an alternate form and all of this stuff. It's a <laughs> challenge, but petiere is standing for petiwerunt. Okay, um, so good to that's know. a good thing to pay attention good to. Know. to. I I'll take that down, write that down. Yes, okay. put that in your notes from class today. Okay, so now we have um, ruent, something's rushing in the, that's plural, um, and I see omnes, rivers rush down de Montibus. so omnes is next. Um, oh, I see, I see um, that same cave wrapping around um, Dido and the Trojan leader who are coming down into the same cave, so um, Dido Dukes at Troianus are next with Dewinion. Okay. Yep. Um, and then um, I see several nominative. I, I see um, uh, the at at with Tellus and Uno. So we've got two goddesses, um, Daunt Signum, giving the signal um, for this wedding, which really kind of makes it unfair to Dido that everybody's working against her. And then, of course, Prima, um, you know, first Mother Earth and Juno as the bridesmaid is the pronuba part. So Wait, those are what, all nominative. Which, which Latin words are the nominative of Daunt? The prima tellus at pronuba, you know, I think. You, are the I, I know, I know. I do you know though, right? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, and I know. So yeah, okay, no good, worries, good. no worries. We know, we know. We now. know, we know. Okay. okay. So um, next we've got that full seire and, um, you know, between the semicolon and the et, I'm pretty sure it's ignes is the plural subject. And again, that's an alternate form, full seirunt. Um, so the, the fires gleamed. And then you wanted me to talk about these other two nominatives, yes, which, um, you know, kind of don't um, fit in because we've got the et putting a divider there. And then we've got another quay before we get to the next verb. So um, I think you have to imply a form of sum here with um, conscius I there. So um, the heaven I there um, was a witness. You could supply a, a rot or a fuit, something like that, um, to the marriages, to the marriage ceremonies, to the nuptials, whatever you want to do with conubiis. Um, and then finally, we've got Numfai Ulularunt, the um, the nymphs howled from the um, highest summit. And that's a weird looking word, though, Ulularunt. Yeah, another syncopation for Ululawerunt. Did I have too many syllables in there? That's like a, a onomatopoeia. There's Ooh, like I a... think uh, there's like four ules. Ulu. No, but it is an automatopoeia. Yeah. yeah. Ululawe, 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 yeah. Yeah, ululawe exactly. uh, and I think uh, Virgil likes his syncopations because they help him fit verbs into the scansion line. I don't think he could have fit ululawe runt. That's just so many long syllables. Um, and yet he wants to use this word. And so he can he can pull out a syllable, especially the common VIs or VEs um, in Latin. Okay, so Absolutely. Okay, so let's, I think we're bringing William back. Um, oh, and this slide, by the way, looks at, uh, just shows you where everything is in the passage. Um, so you can kind of see how it kind of like runs down. So, okay, uh, William. Are you yes, back? Sir. welcome back. Okay, this is not multiple choice, so you can't. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Ooh, uh, all right. but, uh, but we have, uh, again, looking at the different, um, the, the, the backbone of the passage here, I have all of these verbs that are underlined. Um, I would love for you to translate them. And if you can give me their subjects, that would be great too. Um, but you don't have to give me their subjects. Like you can just, you can just give me, let's just the straight, um, the bare verb translated. The bare but, verb. All right. Yeah. So fuit um, was like, ha or has been, but I think it was in this context. So il a dies primus leiti, primus quae malorum causa. Yeah, that day was the first one of death. Talk about foreshadowing right there. You should just end the Given book the context, point, right? I know, right? 
<laughs> and the and the first one, the the cause of all the evils. Yeah. All right. And so the, I see the next one is Mo Wei Toward. Um Neku Enim Specie Fama We Mo Wei Toward Nek Yam for Tiwum Dido Meditatu Amorum. So I think Mo Wei Tour, we need to translate that as is moved. And the Why? subject is Dido because of Why the tour ending. Oh, because of the tour ending, it's passive voice. It has oh. to be passive voice, right? Yes, good. Just checking. Okay. I was just Oof. checking. All right, but see, the next Meiji tour though, it cannot be passive. Why? Because, because I see Amorium as an accusative, right? So oh. it has a direct object. So I. I'm thinking this is meditor, the deponent verb. So, dido meditator, and dido considers this love. So, I love how you use the context of that sentence to help you figure out whether a verb that isn't one of the more common deponent verbs is uh, is deponent, though, right? Has a direct object, you know, you can treat it actively if it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. That's smart. Always look, that. look at that line, look at the surroundings. To, for context to help you figure out the answer. All right. And so, and I think this continuous idea, can you give him walk out? So she calls. Yes. What does she call right. it? She, she's calling this a marriage. Mm. <laughs> mm. And again, what? notice it's like, she calls this. And so, but I'm not going to get into that debate right now because <laughs> that's like, it's a great opportunity to debate this, if whether you're a team Aeneas or team Dido or team deities above. <laughs> pretty, pretty sure Aeneas and Dido are going to debate this fact yeah. in, oh, the, in a couple sure. of lines. Yeah. In a couple of lines, right. All right. And then Pritexit. So I think it's still she. So she conceals this. She covers this up. Uh, this Kolpom, Hulk no mine, this fault of with this name although i don't know like that's i feel like that's kind of virgil inserting himself a little bit talking about this this joining as a fault when i don't know if it's a fault just saying just saying could, but like i, mean, I said from, we can get into that debate later <laughs> from psychosis perspective right true maybe, yeah. absolutely okay and then ex templo libui magnas et fama per urbe so all right, so there's a period, and so I think I can. This is a new thought, and I think this is going to be a great introduction for Fama, um, rumor, the goddess rumor. So Fama, it. So Fama goes, rumor goes. Is that how we translate it? Yeah, don't translate it as it. It's so, it, yeah. yeah, you want to because it'd just be so nice because of the English, but yeah, it means goes. Yeah, and what, how does that? song go rumor has it dun, 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 dun. <laughs> right or something like that i don't know but definitely don't translate as has but don't translate it has it but goes yeah <laughs> rumor okay. goes rumor goes rumor goes rumor. <laughs> okay so uh so i guess we're moving on to our rumor section uh here we yeah. go right so uh thank you william for that um what that are we was doing awesome. here, Jenny? That was yeah. awesome. So, um, Ben, yeah. last um, last spring, when um, you and I did this for like seven weeks or something like that, it was forever. Um, yeah, it did seem like a long time. Um, uh, we one of my favorite things was that we had the opportunity to really appreciate your skills at drawing, and so um, you know, uh, William was just talking about a rumor being introduced here, and it's such a great and important image from book four. So I thought this would be a good opportunity for both you and our students um, to draw this. So we're going to do a quick draw because uh, we don't quick have a draw. lot of time. We still okay. got to get to the Kahoot. All sorts of things happening today. Um, so um, I want to encourage both you and your students to draw this image as I read through it. And then um, students, we would love for you to submit your images on our feedback form, which we didn't link to earlier, but it's at the bottom of the video. <laughs> Insert link here. Insert link or link, here. Link exactly. goes here. Exactly. Okay, so, so I'm going to go away from this passage so you can see, see me draw live. Is that okay? Right. So um, students may want to open to an EAD like 175 to 187, somewhere in that range or 170. 76, I think we're going to do to 187, um, something like that. But um, I'm going to read it out loud. So yeah, you go okay. away from it. 
And, um, you know, students, if you want to take more time than we're going to take in this video to draw, um, feel free to take more time. Just make sure you get to us to, because tomorrow's our last day. So we won't be able to, you know, display their beautiful images um, unless they get it to us before tomorrow's live stream. So keep that in mind. Keep that in okay. mind, Discipuli. Okay. All right. So I'm going to describe rumor to you. So okay. Parwa metu primo so at first she's small because of her fear but mocks soon atolit she raises sese herself in auras into the breezes um in greditorque solo and she proceeds on the ground at caput inter nubula condit and condit she hides her caput her head inter nubula among the clouds so um much. and i do just um want to um point out here um how fantastic this image is and that when we get student images we love to see them labeled with latin but ben you don't have a lot of time so you just you just keep drawing don't worry inter, about the latin inter nubula right parwa mm -hmm. Parwa, that, yes. that's, that's like you, right? right? Right, like me, but hopefully I'm not as, you know, bad as this rumor, but who knows? Parwa, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make it a, 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 a little bird, right? I'm gonna make it a bird. Oh, I think we're getting some bird imagery soon. So we get this section where we get the origins that Terra Parains, so Mother Earth, pro Genuit birthed her, and she's described as Kellerum Pedibus, um, swift on her feet at Pernicibus Alis and nimble wings. Okay, so and I'll do that. We get nimble wings. There we go. Then we get the my favorite elision in the whole Aeneid. Monstrorendingains. This horrible monster that's huge with those two elisions. Um, and we learned that Kui Sunt, um, she has caught plumai as many feathers. Ooh, feathers. Okay. So let's mm -hmm. see. Feathers. Corpore on her body. Feathers. As uh, wiggles oculi, as watchful eyes, super <laughs> beneath. Okay. Yeah, good luck. Good luck. Okay. Mirabile dictu, says Virgil. Yeah. Okay. Taught linguae as many tongues. Oh, as many tongues? Holy cow. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a tongue. That's a tongue. That's Taught to them ora sonat. The same number of mouths resound. The same nice. number of mouths? So she got a mouth then. I guess the mouth I mean, is maybe where yeah, the tongue is. I mean, she's, yeah, exactly. As many okay. mouths as tongues. Okay. okay. Uh, taught auris subrigate. She raises so many ears. Uh, she got ears now too? Oh, I know. Okay, I know. So she's, she's just one ear. So we'll do that. Yeah, because she's got to listen to all the rumors so that then she can spread them with all those mouths and tongues. Okay. All right. So Nocte at night, Wolot, she flies oh, medio okay. in Let's the see. middle. <sighs> Kaili Teraikwe of the sky and the land, per umbram stridanes, shrieking through the shadow. Shriek. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Neck declinat, and she doesn't recline lumina, her eyes, dolki okay. somno, in sweet sleep. So okay. even though it's night, she's wide awake. Mm, got it. Luke by day, set at oh, Costos. Daytime now. Okay. Well, well, I don't know if you can do all of this, but you know. Well, now it's she daytime. She sits as a guard. Shh. Out culminate either on the top sumi tecti of the highest rooftop, out altis turbos, or on the high towers et on towers territat, and she terrifies magnas urbes. And how could she not? Ben, you've done a great job. Uh, I, I wonder if my drawing itself is terrifying, uh, magnas urbes. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really good. It's really good. Is it now? Okay. Um, I'm going to get ready to, I'm going to start the Kahoot so that we can get going. Oh, Are it's you Kahoot ready for time. us to switch over? I think it's Kahoot time. I think so. I'm going to, I guess I can't really finish, but that's okay. I'd love to see what everyone else is able to draw, see how much better their pictures of Fama are going yeah, to be. So. I'm, I'm looking forward to them. You can hear the Kahoot going. So I'm going to switch screens and we'll go ahead. Everybody can go to www.kahoot.it as usual. And um, our game pin today is Quator Unus Unus Noem Quinque Quinque Octo. Um, and Emma from my school again was fifth place yesterday. We didn't hear from anybody else. Um, so hopefully today, um, we'll get some, some more students giving us feedback, insert link here, 
This um, Emma, yeah, this Emma uh, seems to be watching a lot. Yes, yes, very good student, very good student. Um, I have to say, probably my my best, uh, one of my best. Uh, you were saying the other year. day that that she's like only like your second favorite. <laughs> well, you know, you can't. <laughs> not everybody, not everybody can be the favorite. Um, okay, so just a reminder that as we get going on this Kahoot, um, which you can join with the code Quatuor Unus Unus Noem Quinque Quinque Octo, um, that um, the um, code will be at the bottom of your screen. So even if you get started late with us, don't worry, you can still participate. We're going to be practicing reading comprehension and sight translation today. So um, it's, there's going to be some challenge here. Hopefully we won't make people as upset as we did yesterday with the apostrophe issue, but can't, we'll just see. Can't please everyone. everyone. Okay. Yeah, so this first one is going to ask students to translate. And luckily, even though there's a delay on our live stream, hopefully this has already showed up on their screens because this is going to require them to do some good thinking. Yeah. Um, so we have this line, dissimulare etiam, dissimulare etiam sperasti perfide tantum posse nefas. Um, so in the translations they're given, one of the first things is that perfide, the um, vocative. So um, hopefully. It, yeah, look at that sperasti, which is a, a syncopated verb, as we've talked about mm -hmm. today. That, that's a big help, I think, with these. I do, too. I do, too. Even though it's syncopated, hopefully people remember the isti, e isti it, right? So um, the perfide does not mean thoroughly faithful. It is an insult. She calls Aeneas a traitor, and she asks, have you even hoped to pretend, to be able to pretend such a great impiety. That's not even um, the worst thing she calls him in this section. No, no, it's not. Okay, Proud Bison, what a great name for today. All right, in this next one, we're going to ask again about literary devices, because this is something that, um, you know, as you mentioned today, even when we're talking about translation, you um, may, you're going to be asked on the multiple choice about literary devices as well. Well, eight people quickly, very quickly saw this. Yeah. So we have nec te noster amor, nec te data dextera quondam nec moritura tenet crudeli funere dido. Um, so is it apostrophe, temesis, personification, or polysyndeton? I think they got it so fast because the neck, 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 right, yep. is a great clue that it's polysyndeton. We've got more conjunctions than we need here. It helps to remember that neck is a conjunction, right? Uh, gentle condor. Yeah, it does help. It does help. All right. So we're looking at the same line now, but now it's a reading comprehension question, which was one of our fo foci for today. Foki uh, for today. Um, so we want to know what's not mentioned. Okay. So it says, um, do, um, you know, all of these things, neck te tenet, not hold you. And there's a bunch of things that are mentioned, but what's not mentioned, their future marriage, because um, that's they, they don't have a future marriage. They don't have a future marriage. <laughs> Nor their past sadly, marriage. Sadly, yeah. sadly. Well, I think they did because Juno was there as a bridesmaid. But like I said, we don't have time to debate that today. Actually, I think William said that and he was right. Do you know so, who was there? Okay. No. Yes. Okay. I do. Sorry. I do know. All right. It's all right. So here we're looking for the main verb in this section, which is a challenge. Um, because sometimes we, um, you know, didn't necessarily talk about this, but sometimes we see um, that um, infinitives can be serving as a historical infinitive, as a main verb. Um, so we've got several infinitives. We've got some things that look like infinitives that may or may not be. Um, and then we've got this verb properas, that looks like an accusative plural, but it's the second person singular. So, um, you know, are you hurrying um, under the winter cedar sky, under the winter star to build your fleet? But these distractors uh, are not very distracting. Uh, well, that's we have a great doing. crew with us today. So yeah. well, we do have a good crew with us today and they've Oof. been working hard for the last couple of weeks. Yes, they have. OK, so now we want the case of crudelis. Um, and, um, you know, the question is, can it be, is it nominative, genitive, ablative, or evocative? It can be several of these. 
But in this particular situation where she's asking, you know, are you even hurrying um, to, you know, build your fleet in the winter time and to go in the middle of the north winds, pair altum through the deep. So what's Crudalis doing here? I think, I think my kids look at the commas, right? My kids look at the punctuation on these two. Mm -hmm. um, but for whatever reason, um, these uh, this vocative is very often asked. Um, so, you know, look for the commas. Thomas, cruel one uh, is what she calls Aeneas, yet another name. All right, well, classy penguins doing pretty third well. Third declension words, right? Third declension words, the vocative is the nominative, so. Yes, and honestly, for most words, the vocative and the nominative are the same, so that's a good guideline. Okay, so again, we've got a translation here, okay? Um, and we are mainly focusing on maneret and uh, petereitur. Um, but the Troy, as the subject of Petereitor, is thrown in here. So, um, you know, quid C, what if Dido is asking Aeneas? Um, and we want to focus on the tense. Okay, well, last week we reviewed tenses. Hopefully that's helping on this particular part. Pay attention um, to the RE, I think, in Maneret and Petereitor. Yes, absolutely. The RE hopefully will help people out um, to realize that um, this is a certain tense. Um, the RE won't be will have remained because that would be an ERI, right? But instead, imperfect tense. Good job. We've got a great crew today. Classy penguin holding out. Last one. This one is just a translation. How do we translate mene fugus? It, do we have, are you fleeing me? Am I to flee? Surely you don't flee me. And are you putting me to flight? Um, there's these two verbs in the Aeneid, fugo fugare and uh, fugo fugare, fuga o fugare, sorry. Fugio, fugio, yeah. Fugo o fugare. And um, my students confuse them pretty easily. What about yours, Ben? Uh, yes, and they actually show up um, Sometimes they're the one that you don't think is more common, which is fugo fugare, shows up more commonly in other situations, like especially in military contexts. Um, you put people to flight, um, but uh, this this phrase should be very. Um, it, you should remember this because this gets called back in book six when Aeneas visits Dido, um, and he's like, "What is it? Is it you know? Are you fleeing me? Um, you know things like that." So. There we go. Yeah, Are you absolutely. Yeah. So um, if we were um, expecting some sort of answer um, with the surely you don't flee me, we would get a no nay or a noom, um, depending on whether we were expecting a yes, no nay or a noom um, negative answer. But the nay on the end just is a straight question. Are you fleeing me? All right. We'll check our podium really fast and then we need to wrap things up, I think. Yeah, it's so, a, it's a it's a quem fugus, I think, in book six. Whom do you flee? Whom are you Because Aeneas is completely clueless. Yes, exactly. Not um, like, not like. Sturdy, sturdy goat. Sturdy goat. <laughs> sturdy goat did great. All right. Full good job, clues. sturdy goat. Yes, exactly. Congratulations uh, again. You know, we'll be glad to give you a shout out if you want to send us your um, state or your city or your school or your teacher's name, any of those things. Okay, so um, just briefly uh, talking about what happens in the rest of book four in the English reading, we talked about how Dido uh, talks to Anna at the beginning to uh, see if she can get some advice, and Anna encourages her to pursue this relationship. Juno creates the storm. Um, second time Juno creates a storm, in fact, uh, during the hunt, the, the famous hunt, um, to wed the two. And construction of Carthage is halted um, because of this. Remember, Dido in, is contrasted in book four with uh, what we see of her in book one. Um, after pleading with Aeneas to stay, Dido tricks Anna into building this pyre um, with all of Aeneas's stuff, um, with the understanding that like she's found the secret cure um, for uh, her love for him in order to um, to. Uh, cure herself of of this passion she has. Um, and then we talked at the very beginning too about how Juno sends Iris down from Olympus to cut a lock of Dido's hair. Um, that's actually in the English reading, but it's important to bring up here because, um, because again, this rainbow is, um, uh, it's a very beautiful ending to a very stressful book. 
And uh, we have this uh, practice folder here that you can access with a link that's actually on the slide. Um, and you can get closed translations. There's a GIM kit with verb translations. Uh, we're doing book six tomorrow, which is the final, uh, this is the final one for us, Jenny, for these review videos. And book six is the last bit of Latin that we have to cover. So you might want to review these lines and we're going to be talking about essay writing. So uh, if you'd like to prepare a little bit more for tomorrow, um, there are a bunch of AP Daily videos that discuss writing the essay. Um, and we have uh, them listed here. There are seven that you can check out. Uh, it might not be bad to review this. You'll get some Latin review as well. So um, always the more review you can do, the better. Um, so please uh, think about doing that. Set yourself up for some success uh, on our uh, live stream tomorrow. Just uh, reminding you here, give us responses. The link goes below. And what do we know now? What should we know now, Jenny? Quid nunc scamus. We know that we should put in the link tomorrow. So we'll be prepared for that. Um, so we've looked at Virgil's Aeneid today. We've reviewed some of book four. Um, these are the lines that you should review um, for the exam. We've talked about how to approach sight reading and how um, that's just a great way to approach reading generally. Um, we practiced with a Kahoot. And uh, just a reminder in that folder that Ben was showing you, I will put that Kahoot for you to keep practicing. I'll put a link to it on the helpful links page. And we've briefly touched on the events of book four in the Aeneid. And we've also hosted our friend William Lee um, here today, who we were so excited to have. So um, we will say goodbye to everybody. Thanks so much for coming, William. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone. And it's we'll see you blast. tomorrow, right? Yes. Tomorrow for the last tomorrow, one, Aeneid book six. Last day. Looking forward to it. Wale te